You know, when most people hear that distinct sound of a Fender Telecaster, they immediately think country music. You know, they say the heart of country music's in Nashville. Well, I'm not going to debate that today. But what I will say is that some of the greatest artists that are out there would not be where they're at today if it weren't for some of the great musicians that supported them. Many go unnoticed and are unsung heroes. Today we're going to visit a museum that's in a little town called Waynesboro. That's in Wayne County, Tennessee. And it's about 100 miles southwest of Nashville. The museum pays homage to those unsung heroes, many of which are from Waynesboro or surrounding communities. From major country stars to house band musicians to some of the greatest songwriters, this museum celebrates some of the best. In addition, this museum offers a great amount of other history and artifacts directly from those individuals right around the area. You'll see items from the Civil War to World War II to Vietnam and more. From major movie stars to infamous outlaws that once passed through this town. The Wayne County Museum has a little bit of everything for everyone. Join us today for this episode of History and Relics. Today we're in Waynesboro, Tennessee to visit the Wayne County Museum that's located downtown at Courthouse Square. Waynesboro is situated at the junction of State Route 13 and U.S. Route 64. It was founded in 1821 and had a population of just 236 in 1880. Today it has a population of approximately 2,419. Now we're going to pan around here and give you a quick look at the downtown courthouse area. You can see several local businesses, including Full Throttle Nutrition, the Bank of Waynesboro, Tennessee Quality Hospice Center, the courthouse itself, Shackelford's Funeral Home off in the distance, Emerald's Restaurant, and radio station WWON Big Oldies AM 930 or FM 100.7. And that all leads us up to the Wayne County Museum. So let's go inside and see what this is all about. The Wayne County Museum opened in 2017. Here's a photo from the ribbon cutting that graces the Facebook page. What was really special about our trip to the museum was that we got to meet some of the people featured in this photo and they shared with us stories of items featured in the museum that belonged to them or one of their family members. Some of the people we got to meet during our visit was Dean Stagall. In the red, off to the far left, Floyd Staggs, or better known as Babe, in the suit nearest the center, Jeff Howe in the black v-neck shirt to your far right, and behind him in the blue plaid shirt, Eddie Thompson. Also featured in this 2017 photo are two big country music celebrities including Don Van Tress, back center left with the long silver hair and mustache, who wrote Achy Breaky Heart that was a smash hit for Billy Ray Cyrus in 1992, and Waynesboro's biggest hometown celebrity, Singer, songwriter, musician, actor, record producer, and the list goes on, Mark Colley, who's in the white shirt, back center right, holding a guitar. Two spaces to the right of Mark Colley is former American Idol star, Jimmy Smith. We want to send a big thank you out to Babe Staggs for having some of the local celebrities that made such a huge impact in the music industry present at our video shoot. It was an awesome surprise and we thank you. 
Once inside the museum, your eyes will immediately open wide in awe of all the great, great items they have on display. From original military uniforms worn by honored servicemen and women to huge panoramic billboards of what the downtown area of Waynesboro used to look like in the 40s and 50s, to movie posters featuring Wayne County attractions, signed guitars, tour jackets, special trophies and awards, and so much more. You've just got to see this. Our first guest speaker to talk about his playing days is Kenneth Davis of the Davis Brothers. Now here's a picture of Ken from the mid-1950s when he played fiddle for the Bob Titus Band out of Detroit, Michigan before heading to Nashville. Ken's brother Ralph was interviewed by a Keith Cady in 2003 where he commented on his brother being a great musician as he played mandolin, fiddle, and was a great guitar player. He further stated that Ken got his first guitar in Detroit. It was an electric Gibson, but he later found his calling with a Fender Stratocaster that he still has and plays today. Kenneth Davis, I'm a member of the Davis Brothers Band. I played lead guitar with the Davis Brothers. I kind of introduced my brother to you. This is a younger brother that played uh, they drums with George Jones. I think he had two different hitches with George. I believe he played maybe a three-year deal and maybe a two-year deal. And also, he was uh, a member, had two brothers, a member of the opera staff band. Glenn was one that played, uh, played drums with George. And Ralph played rhythm there for 35, 40 years, I think. During some of this time, well, there was finally at one time four of us got together and worked with Roy Drusky for one summer doing working package show, one shows around. Then uh, Merle Haggard covered him on uh, uh, a song, <laughs> and uh, I can't think of the name of the song, but then when he covered him on that song, our, our work kind of ceased. <laughs> But uh, anyway, the two brothers there worked with the opera staff band. And back so these so these guys backed up many of the artists that came on the Grand Ole Opera. Yeah, they worked they uh, they worked with about everybody that come along doing the pack doing package shows or wherever. Most of it was there at the opera. Okay. But this is a time when we were three of us. A younger brother was still with George Jones, and there's three of us. And, booked out of Nashville there with this stand, this three more people that come from come from North Carolina. This lady here and this steel player and the rhythm player and the singer. They from North Carolina. And this was me playing lead guitar and my older brother Ralph and Guy playing bass. Okay. And Guy was uh, he was a sheriff here in Wayne County for eight years. And you're time. playing at the Golden Nuggets in yeah, Vegas, right? We're playing at the Golden Nugget. Had two week gig at two week gig at the Golden Nugget in Vegas, and I'm kind of thrilled to do that because of remember seeing the Golden Nugget in the uh, old Western movies. It's kind of thrilled. To... So this was about what year? This picture? That was in '65. '65. All right. Mm -hmm. And then you told me earlier you still had that uh, that Fender Strat there in the back, right? A '59. It's '59 model Fender Stratocaster. I, yeah. And uh, I've had people who wanted to buy it, but I I've kept it, and I think I'll just keep it. <laughs> there you go. The kids kind of want to hold on to it, so that's nice. That's a good pick. Jimmy Caps just passed away here not long ago. He's on the end? Yeah, he's on the end there. Okay. Jimmy, he was a lead guitar there. He did on, he worked on the sheriff's, you know, that sheriff's show. Okay. Uh, anyway, he's a good friend. All of them are, are friends. He was a friendly bunch of people. We knew them all. Well, and this is your jacket here on the end? Is this your jacket? No, that's my, that's Ralph's jacket. That's my older brother. Okay. Older brother Jackie. So they had a they had a basketball. At one time they had a basketball team that was kind of playing, you know. Okay. This private stuff. So they wound up the friend on our I guess got them jackets for them. Oh, nice. For the ball games. Okay. I don't know. It just uh, we had a 
I got a little nephew that works at Opry now. Hmm. He's still working at Opry, Danny Davis. It's Ralph's son. He told me the other day that he liked one year of being in the Opry as long as his dad was. Hmm. Dad was there 40 years off and on, and he's been there 39. Yeah. Wow. Was, yeah. And I was trying to think of the lady. He works quite a bit with this lady. I can't think of her name. I'm about <laughs> now what year? This is more recent picture here. This the smaller one here on the counter. Yeah, this one is only. This is the only picture that we got of the Davis brothers. And we worked. I don't know how many years off and on with <laughs> different people. But this was doing a doing a little uh, show over in Collin. Yeah. Uh, okay. And this this is a brother here that was sheriff. That's guy. And that's me. And yeah, Glenn yeah, was playing drums, and Ralph doing singing and playing rhythm. Okay. And that's the only picture we've got of all four of us. And you can find a picture where there's two or there's three, but <laughs> no, that's the only one. Uh, that's awesome. All right, let's switch gears and talk some American history for a minute. On September 16, 1940, the United States, under the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, instituted the Selective Training and Services Act of 1940, which required all men between the ages of 21 and 45 to register for the draft. This was the first peacetime draft in the United States history. Those who were selected for the draft lottery were required to serve at least one year in the armed forces. Once the U.S. entered World War II, draft terms extended through the duration of the fighting. By the end of the war in 1945, 50 million men between 18 and 45 had registered for the draft and 10 million had been inducted into the military. The photo you see here is of Secretary of War Henry Stimson being blindfolded as he draws the very first number for the nation's first peacetime military draft lottery in Washington on October 29, 1940. And that very first person was none other than Wayne County resident, Turner Smith. Let's roll the clock back now to the Old West and talk about John Wesley Hardin, one of the West's most brutal and infamous gunfighters and outlaws in history. He was born on May 26, 1853 in Bonham, Texas to James Gibson Hardin and Mary Elizabeth Dixon. His father was a Methodist preacher and named after the founder of the Methodist denomination, John Wesley. By his own account, Hardin claimed to have killed over 40 men, with the first being when he was only 15 years old. One man he killed just for snoring too loud. He was later sentenced to 25 years at a Huntsville, Alabama prison for another of his killings, but only served 17 of those years and was released on February 17, 1894. While in prison, he wrote a book and studied law. When he was released, he was later pardoned, received his license to practice law, and went back to Texas. In 1895, the sheriff of El Paso tried to create a safer town by outlawing the carrying of guns. In August of that same year, Hardin's girlfriend was caught with a gun and arrested by Officer John Selman. Hardin's temper flared and he made public threats against Selman for bothering his girlfriend. Not long afterwards, on August 19, 1895, Selman went looking for Hardin and found him throwing dice or playing cards at the bar of the Acme Saloon. Not a word was said when Selman walked up and shot Hardin in the back of the head, killing him. So what's all this have to do with Wayne County, Tennessee? Well, as previously stated, Hardin's father was a Methodist preacher. He was born on March 2, 1823, in Wayne County, Tennessee. John's grandfather, Benjamin P. Hardin, born 1780, was a justice of the peace and the first sheriff of Wayne County. Ben was also a general assemblyman for the state of Tennessee and helped to establish Wayne County, which was named to honor General Mad Anthony Wayne of the Revolutionary War. John's great-grandfather was Colonel Joseph Hardin Sr., who, among many great things, was a Revolutionary War hero and Justice of the Peace in Greene County, Tennessee in 1796. 
Isn't it strange and interesting how one family can be on polar opposites of the law? It's just amazing. All right, let's get back to some great country and rockabilly music featuring Lloyd Howe, who sang Little Froggy Went a Courtin' in October 1961. His son, Jeff, is going to talk about his father now and show you some of his memorabilia and share with you some great stories. Hello, I'm Jeff Howell, and I'd like to show you a few of the items that we have in the counter here. I, I'm uh, the son of Lloyd Howell. That's his picture down there, one of his pictures. And, um, he's, he went to Detroit in the 50s to get work at the automotive factories like so many people did back in those days and played music up there and uh, cut some records, uh, which there's a couple on display. Some of his, his records are in movies, actually. There's a couple different movies that they, they've come up in. I don't know how or why, but they did. But anyway, me and uh, my sisters and family and even my daughter, we all played music together through the years and in the uh, Detroit area as well as down here when we moved back to Tennessee and opened the store. But uh, he's got a lot of uh, memorabilia on the internet. If you type in his name, just type in Lloyd Howell and the first thing comes up will be a bunch of things of his and different records and, and memorabilia that he had. But uh, we have a, a lot of memories, I guess you'd say, in, in the Detroit area as well as down here in uh, Waynesboro, Tennessee, which is where he's originally from. And uh, we've, I've been living here since 1977, so I've lived here more than anywhere else. And, uh, and that jacket is the one he has on in that very picture. Right? Yeah, that's, and, and uh, to tell you the truth, my mother made that. Wow, okay. She made that for him, and uh, she made him another jacket that, I don't know, it may be at home, that's uh, blue, and it's made out of Cadillac seat covers. <laughs> that's cool. He worked that's at pretty cool. He worked at Cadillac, and, and uh, it's, it's the material that was on the seats. Wow, that's and, uh, pretty cool. So, so it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, he played the... Uh, more country music is what he has, his idol was, I guess, uh, Hank Williams Sr. He played country music, but he's actually known as a rockabilly artist. Hmm. He's supposed to be in the Rockabilly Hall of Fame. I, I, I've not confirmed that, but people's told me that they've seen it. And uh, uh, his songs that kind of made a hit are known as rockabilly, and, and they're on a lot of uh, uh, different CDs that, out of Germany and stuff uh, uh, with the rockabilly artist. Hmm. So that's that's a lot of this information. Really. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yes, you said that Froggy went to court? <laughs> yeah, Froggy went to court and is one of the... Uh, but it's big over overseas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I said, if you type, type on Google, type his name in, and it'll, it'll come up with all those records. Or, or on YouTube. There's uh, I can't tell you how many there is on YouTube, and I've not put none of them on there. You know, it's hmm. from somewhere else, other countries or other places. Now, speaking about rockabilly treasures, how could we not wrap up today's video without a short story about Elvis Presley? The story begins with this man, Dewey Harper. And long before he became a judge in Waynesboro, he was working as a DJ for the radio station WBIP out of Boonesville, Mississippi that is known today as WBIP, the Dove, 99.7 FM, or 1400 AM. WBIP began broadcasting on September 1st of 1950. It aired block programming and was owned by E.O. Roden. On January 17th of 1955, just over a week after his 20th birthday, Elvis Presley performed at the Junior College Auditorium in Boonesville, Mississippi. Elvis also visited WBIP for an interview with DJ Lynn McDowell to support airplay of his records. In 1957, Elvis, still very actively playing in the area at that point, signed the guitar to Dewey, which is proudly displayed at the Wayne County Museum today. So let's take a look.
What a wonderful time we had at the Wayne County Museum today. Thanks again to everyone who took time out of their day to come and speak about their memorabilia and share their stories. Thanks as well to Floyd Babe Staggs for coordinating this opportunity. It was a good time had by all. Lastly, we'd like to thank all the musicians, entertainers, singers, songwriters, and everyone in between for lending their artifacts to the museum for all to see. Without these treasures, the museum just wouldn't be. Another thing that really helps nonprofit entities like the Wayne County Museum is donations and funding. If you or a family member would like to contribute an artifact or relic to the museum, or most importantly, make an ever so needed monetary donation to help them maintain this incredible sanctuary, please consider contacting the Wayne County Museum today. Every dollar is used wisely and is greatly appreciated. I made a donation, won't you? Thank you. If you'd like to visit the museum in person, they're located at 100 Court Circle, Waynesboro, Tennessee, 38485. Their mailing address is the Wayne County Museum, P.O. Box 125, Waynesboro, Tennessee, 38485. And their telephone number is area code 931-722-5016. Well, folks, it's time to put the old Fender Telly back into the case and keep moving on. But before we do, please be sure to watch part two on the museum coming soon. If you thought this was good, there is even more exciting stuff discussed in part two. And until then, this one's history. Yeah.